Does this pattern sound familiar to you? You wake up, dazed, consume dangerous amounts of caffeine in a futile attempt to feel alive, get ready for a lecture that will most likely put you to sleep, realize that it's actually Wednesday and you don't have a lecture. Crap! It's Wednesday! Your project about Amazonian tree frogs is due today and so far all you've done is playing around with fonts. Instead of actually working, you procrastinate even further. How could this happen? The assignment was handed out months ago. What happened to all that time? Your grandparents sold their house so you could get an education. What would they say if they knew you spent your days crying and watching reality television? You're spiraling, your mental health degrading before your very eyes. Your skin has hardly tasted the sun in weeks. You barely sleep and eat little else than instant noodles. Friendship is an increasingly foreign concept to you and happiness a vague memory. Darkness looms on the horizon, ready to devour what's left of your pathetic and worthless being. If this applies to you, chances are you're a university student. And though I can't tell you whether what you're studying is going to pay off, I can tell you about some similar struggles that our forefathers had back in the old Middle Ages. See, universities aren't a new concept. They've been around for about 1,000 years. They first popped up in Italy, where the University of Bologna still exists today, and in Paris. Though they started as skills of teachers and students, by the 12th century, European universities had colleges and attracted students from all over the continent. If you've ever been a student, be it at university or elsewhere, you've probably encountered your fair share of bad teachers. Of course, you had to simply suck it up and go about learning despite their incompetence. If only you had the ingenuity of the students of the medieval University of Bologna. See, when they thought a teacher was poor, they simply kicked him out and found a replacement, since the school was run by the students rather than the teachers. I bet 11-year-old you would have loved to see the back of Mrs. Fraser and her foul breath, this was admittedly an exception rather than the rule. You may now be wondering what was studied at these universities. The curriculum was different from what we know because the education was meant to train students for future jobs within the church. But basically there were seven areas that people had to study, broken down into the trivium and the quadrivium. The trivium consisted of grammar, how to language good, rhetoric, how to persuade good, and logic, how to debate good. Medieval debating could get very technical. So, son, learn anything useful at that school of yours? Uh, yeah, like logic. See that shovel you're holding? Now, check this out. So basically, if you think about it, you're actually holding two shovels, not just one. You are a mistake. Then there was the quadrivium. It consisted of arithmetic, music, astronomy and geometry. Together, this all was referred to as a liberal arts education. Students would typically complete a bachelor's degree in these studies in four years and could then go on and become masters or doctors. If they chose to continue after their bachelor's, their path of study would be one of theology, law, arts or medicine. Much like today, studying at university was challenging and could be very stressful. Thankfully, the students had a time-old tradition to fall back on, that of drinking, gambling and sleeping with prostitutes. Many found that this holy triumvirate was much more fun than reading books or attending lectures and townsfolk grew annoyed at their debauchery. One of the more intriguing scholarly figures of this era was the 12th century philosopher and theologian Peter Abelard. Born in Brittany, Abelard would study ancients such as Cicero and Seneca and establish himself as a brilliant logician. To the people who knew him, he cut a sort of larger-than-life figure, and it was said he never lost a debate. Abelard studied under William of Champeaux, a fellow philosopher and later a bishop, with whom he had a feisty relationship. He would debate with his master relentlessly. What do you got there, William? Oh, just a pair. Really? You sure about that? What do you mean? You know, because there's no such thing as a pair. Gee, not this again, Peter. I'm holding a pair! It's, it's innate pairness that renders it so. No matter who or where you are, this thing remains a pair. But what if there was no people to name it? Then it would only be an arbitrary lump of mass, because that's all it is. The phenomena of pair only exists within the mind. Eventually, Abelard bested him. 
He claimed William grew resentful of him because he outgrew his teacher. However, William claimed Abelard was too arrogant, a view shared by many. This spat with William later came back to bite Abelard when his old master prevented him from getting a lecturing job in Paris. Despite his scholarly genius, poor old Peter Abelard is best known today for his tragic romance with one Heloise, a fellow philosopher who lived with her uncle Fulbert. Abelard was smitten and decided to pursue Heloise, and they began an affair. Now as I said, Abelard was a rather arrogant man, and he did little to hide this affair, writing poems and music about his love for Heloise which spread like wildfire through France. Fulberts, understandably, found out and ordered them separated. But if you ever watch a romantic movie, you know this won't work. Abelard and Heloise continued hooking up and eventually had a son. Abelard and Heloise got married in secret, adding yet another layer to this romantic intrigue. And even though Fulbert was in on it, shit once again hit the fan when Fulbert made the marriage public and Heloise contradicted him by denying it. Abelard, to rescue his wife, sent her away to live with nuns. Fulbert was so furious that he had a group of men break into Abelard's bedroom and castrate him. Abelard was a major public figure at the time, so this was a massive scandal. He was no longer considered a man after this and was regularly mocked, but still kept contact with Heloise through a series of love letters. He would live another couple of decades as a eunuch and is still regarded as one of the greatest minds of his age. So, the moral of the story is, if your studies are bringing you down and you need a reprieve, follow in your ancestors' footsteps. Blow off class, head out to a casino, blow money on martinis, blackjack and hookers, possibly cuddle with a tiger. And if you find yourself broke and need a cheap and local distraction, try falling in love. Find that special someone on your campus. Just make sure to avoid their creepy uncle and hopefully you'll end up with your genitalia still intact. Anyways, that's enough for me. Ashley's clogged up the disabled person's toilet again. I gotta go give him a spanking. See ya. Christ, Ashley, this is worse than ever. Did you eat at that taco vendor again? I told you he puts laxatives in his sauce or something. I'm sorry. Oh, but you did! This is why you have your own bathroom, Ashley. You are an idiot. But another peep from you, and I'll make you do this with your bare hands. <laughs>